This episode of the Southern Hemisphere No-Till Market Garden Podcast is brought to you by Activista. Activista's mission is to assist growers to develop soil-focused, diverse cropping systems with commercially viable seeds, appropriate equipment and soil inputs, and advice and feedback for all growers' current needs and particular situations. Activista is working diligently behind the scenes to maintain and develop their supply of seeds for profitable market farming. Small bulk quantities are at or near cost price. They have a non-GMO pledge and aim to source the best hybrid and heritage varieties to suit each segment and conditions of growers' needs nationally. Activista takes the battle out of importing specialized tools, providing sales and warranty support with all of their equipment range. They carry most, if not all, parts and have a direct line of communication with suppliers. Activista encourages customer feedback and gives personal attention to all inquiries as they see this process as a vital part of our vibrant, developing organic community. This episode is also brought to you by Curly's Ag. Curly's Ag has been in the business of developing and manufacturing innovative ag tools for the past five years. In that short time, they have amassed an impressive range of new and patented tools now readily available for you. Curly's Ag is home to the world's only commercially available battery drill-powered power harrow, as well as Curly's Cracker 2, an automatic broad fork making saw prep and ease in any condition. Curly's Ag is also known for the Elia 3000, a multi-purpose tilter, mulcher and bed former all rolled into one, as well as the most recent and anticipated tool for every farm, the Handy. The Handy is redefining the market garden toolkit and taking the hard work out of farming. It can lift 300 kilograms of these and smoothly manoeuvre over your garden bed without damaging crops. The Handy's PDO powers the Elia 6000, mulcher and tilter, a power harrow, an auger, a compost spreader, a harvester and more attachments. If you like to know more, please jump on their website at curlyzag.com and feel free to contact them for more information. Curly Zag are distributing in the US and soon opening up in Europe. Welcome back to the No-Till Market Gun Podcast. My name is Mikey and today on the show I am very excited to be chatting with Nat Wiseman of Village Greens South Australia. This episode spans a wide range of topics and we dive into selling at farmers markets and how to track sales and figures, Village Greens online sales platforms, how to create flow in your wash and pack station and much, much more. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did. It was an absolute ripper. But before we start, I would like to begin by acknowledging the Kaurna people, traditional custodians of the land on which we talk today, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people listening in today. Now welcome friend and farmer Nat Wiseman of Village Green to the show. Thanks for joining us today, Nat. Thanks, Mikey. Great to be here. Let's start today's show by hearing a little bit about your farm as it currently stands today, Nat, its size, location, and a bit about what you're producing. Yeah, sure thing. So we're based in Adelaide. We're about an hour south of Adelaide in South Australia. Um, We are currently growing on an acre of land. Uh, We've got a couple of um, polytunnels, but mainly field, field production. Um, we, up until recently, we've been selling through, um, a farmer's market and doing online sales. And we just recently moved to, to just do online, uh, only. And yeah, there's a team of, was probably about 10 to 15 of us. Um, but you know, we're all, we're all kind of part-time. So it's, we, there's probably about four full-time equivalents on the farm, um, at any one time. Over the course of our chat today, Nat, I'd love to dive deep into a few topics that you're really passionate about, but I, I want to really use the idea of context as a backdrop to explore how your farm and I think farms in general develop. So let's begin by circling back and looking at how your farm began and developed in the context of its early years. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, it's, I think you're right. It's super important. Every farm has its own story, right? Um, so, yeah, we, we started off um, 2014. We, uh, I was teaching at a permaculture design course um, run by the amazing, amazing uh, food forester, Graham and Anna Marie Brookman, uh, north of Adelaide. Um, and as part of that course, uh, 
the, the participants came to visit an urban farm that I was running at the time uh, called Wagtail Urban Farm. So that, that was like a very small, I think it was 200 square metre little plot uh, in the suburbs that I was running with a friend. Um, and as part of that, um, there, was, there was two... Um, Two girls um, there the, that were participants, Lucy and Ellie, came along and they, they were thinking about setting up a, a market garden on the eco village where they lived, which was in Aldinga, which is you know, where we're now based. But basically, they were thinking about setting a, a market garden up. Um, and at the same time, I was kind of looking for, you know, putting feelers out there for, for more land. Uh, we'd sort of, you know, grown not you know, reached our capacity on the small little urban farm block and I was looking to sort of step it up and, and take it on as a full-time job. So um, it was kind of, you know, serendipitous. We, you know, we met at this event. I was also chatting to a fourth member of the, the original team that started Village Greens, um, Claude. Uh, we were at a dinner party and we were like, hey, we should, you know, totally farm the village, like, you know, farm on the village land. There's all this land that's not being used. It's a community-owned um, kind of land um, that's part of this housing development. So I think it's 17 hectares of land that's commonly owned. Um, and so yeah, so basically um, we started up with the four of us, three three residents of the village and myself, um, and broke ground in 2015. And you know we've been through a lot of changes since then. Um, but yeah, that's, that's really how we, we started was this kind of, you know, it was the right, right place, right time. And, um, yeah, really took it off from there. When you, when you came together, like you said, you were, you started farming on, um, on this community's land. Was the intention to be growing for that community or eventually expanding out? Yeah, I guess we'd always, um, from the beginning, you know, I sort of thought, oh, it's a no-brainer. Like, there's you know, 140 households right next door that we could sell to. Um, and in the early days, we we used to run a market at the village. Um, you know, like a little pop-up market once a week, um, where residents could come and and get their veg, and and that worked okay. But we realised as we were growing that we were just growing like way too much food for the demand of the village like if everyone in the village had been ordering from us that would have been all right but we certainly you know it wasn't that uh that many and and you know at the time I was really kind of like um I don't know like disillusioned I guess because I was like wow people buying the veg but you know the reality is like people are already eating like somewhere else, you know, if you start a new business, you can't just expect people to change their habits overnight um, and, you know, change their shopping habits and, and all of that um, overnight. So so really it was a, a slow, you know, slow increase in, in that kind of connection. So pretty early on we realised we needed to look elsewhere to sell our produce. Um, so we started up... Um, uh, yeah, like a, a very simple kind of online um, like a website and um, did a weekly uh, delivery run. And then a couple of years in, we, we started selling to the, the local farmer's market, which was only 10 minutes up the road. And um, that was, yeah, it was sort of all on from, from then. That was a, a nice big market. And we'd, we'd sold to another farmer's market that was smaller and, and further away. But as soon as we, we got into the Wollonga farmer's market, that was, that really provided us that, you know, the, um, the sales that we needed to, to grow. I'm really, I'm always really interested in, in what, what are the influencing factors behind uh, a farm's sales outlets? You know, often it's, it's passion driven. You want to, you know, either sell to a community, sometimes it's profit driven. This makes sense. So I'm going to send, I'm going to, I'm going to sell, you know, at a farmer's market or I'm going to sell to a restaurant or sell to a wholesale. Um, could you share with us a little bit, a little bit more about what were some of the influencing factors that were, were pushing you to choose a different um, sales outlet? Yeah. I mean, I guess, you know, in the early days we, we were just taking like whoever would have our, our produce really like Claude, you know, Claude's sister worked at a restaurant in, in town and so they started buying from us and then 
you know, that word spread and, you know, we started selling to a few restaurants and um, so it was really, yeah, really kind of organic growth um, that we, we, I guess it wasn't really intentional, you know, we, we kind of, we were just like, yep, you want veg? Like, we've got veg. So uh, that was really how we started off. Um, but um, the the online thing definitely, you know, has taken um, – you know, it took a, lo- a lot to set up. Um, I guess you know, um, one you know, one of the the benefits we had a, a friend who was a web developer, so they they you know they helped us get set up pretty pretty easily um, with that. And um, yeah, so we kind of we were just really like um, I, I don't know what was a pretty haphazard approach and and I guess maybe that was in reaction to not having the certainty of sales that we were expecting from the village um that was kind of our plan a b and c (laughs) and when that didn't happen we were like oh crap like we just gotta um gotta take anywhere we can get um so but then you know starting at Wollonga um like I said it's only 10 minutes away from us um so that was really, really great to to get get into that market and um, and be able to sell to you know the local kind of regional um, uh, customers as well. So yeah, I p- part of why I asked the question is because now you know meet, meeting you now later down in your farming path, I look at you as being a, a super calculated and and data driven farmer, which you know uh, I really want to I, I want to explore you know like you. You, you you recently have stepped away from the farmer's market. Um, you're really pushing the online sales. So it, it's, I, I like looking back in hindsight to when a lot of farmers start. And like you said, sometimes there isn't the, the, the pure intention behind what we choose. It's sometimes driven by purely what, what's available. Look, looking back though, is that something that you'd be advising other young farmers to do to kind of cast the net wide what are, what what are my options, or to be a lot more calculated in terms of finding sales outlets? Yeah, I I mean I always say you know um, like you got to really <laughs> you got to know your markets, and and you know my my thinking early on was like well yeah everyone eats right everyone eats three times a day so and we grow food so you know like you just got to join the dots you know like, so but that was yeah that was pretty naive obviously and. Um, and as I said, you know, it's all about changing, um, changing habits, changing behavior. And, um, so that's, you know, and as, as you know, how it, how it changed takes time. Um, so really, yeah, when I, when I tell, uh, new growers or people looking to start things up now, uh, definitely cautioning, you know, to take a much more kind of, yeah, like you say, a data driven approach and, um, I guess really looking at where the niches are um, in the, the local food um, scene because, um, yeah, I just think, you know, to have everyone, all, all of us small growers kind of competing for this like really small part of the pies is, is not what we want to do. And, um, yeah, we've got to look at how we can collaborate and, and yeah, find, find our own niches. And so that's, yeah, definitely what I recommend um but you know like it, it's it's really hard isn't it it's the chicken or the egg thing like you don't know you've got a market until you've got a product um but often you can't sell the product till you've got a market so you know it, it kind of does have to be a bit of a iterative you know um step-by-step approach i think let's let's dive into the farmer's market so you guys started selling there and I'm, i i want to chat a bit about it and let's you know let's let's jump between presently and and back to the past because as i said now recently you moved away from the farmer's market and i'd love to explore um that kind of process of joining the farmer's market what it did for your business and then consequently later on a number of years down the track why you've made the decision to move away from them Mm. yeah so um i guess starting starting up there as I said, we, we were actually were attending a smaller farmer's market um, that was about 40 minutes away, more of a, a regional market. And, um, you know, we were happy to be doing $500, $700 a week there. Um, and then as soon as we started the Wollonga farmer's market, you know, we were, we were doing 
you know, 1,500, you know, basically doubled our, our sales. Um, and it was, it was only 10 minutes away rather than a 40 minute drive. So, you know, like immediately it was this huge, like, Oh my God, like this is, this is what a market, you know, a, a good market should be. Um, so we were really, uh, really lucky yeah, to, to get into that. You know, it's quite a competitive market. Um, so we, when we started, it was that real, you know, cash flow boost, I guess, that we were looking for in order to say, okay, yeah, we're going to, so we didn't start off at an acre. We started at half an acre of land and, um, and that was really the incentive to, to push it to an acre because we could see the demand was there. Um, and so I guess, you know, um, we also changed our structure as, as we grew and we started off as a, um, having four company directors, um, and then kind of changed to as as people left and moved on, um, or changed roles. You know, now now I'm the sole company director, and, and um, you know, and we've got employees as as this sort of structure. And when you've got employees, you know, you can't <laughs> as a director you can get away with paying yourself nothing, right? Um, you know, or or very little. Um, but when you, you know, when you're an employee, that's obviously not the case. So suddenly we went from, um, you know, being able to run a market and, and kind of just chalk that up to director's fees that we, you know, calculate at the end of the quarter or end of the year to then paying, uh, fortnightly wages. Um, and then also realizing that, you know, it wasn't horticultural rate wages it's you know it's retail award wages um that we that you know that you need to pay a, on a saturday um which means you know in in australia that's you know time and a half of a general retail award so you're looking at like close to 36 dollars an hour for um for staffing a farms market store um and on Sunday, it's probably closer to fifty dollars an hour. So, really, the economics of that changed as we changed as a as a business. Um, and you know, you've um, alluded to it already, but basically, I, you know, recently we I just sat down. I was like, we've got to look at the viability of this because we, you know, there was we had two staff attending the stall. They were doing nine hour day. Um, we had a, a junior helping out, you know, bagging salad and that kind of stuff. And, you know, really looking at you know, actually what are all of our costs associated with the market and realizing that we needed to be grossing a lot more than what we were in order to break even. So that was, that was a bit of a, um, well, it was a massive reality check really um, to realize that we'd been, like selling well and you know we were one of the one of the popular stores at the market and um and you know had lines out out the door every week and um two cash registers and blah 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 but you know realizing that oh actually you know that's all great but it's actually not really <laughs> not really profitable uh you know when you when you take a cold hard look at the numbers so yeah that's it speaks to me a lot i think sometimes um, we farmers kind of like a you know moth to a flame. The the gross the gross sales figures can be a lot more um, enticing to look at rather than the potential profit that you're actually making in a market um, or mm. in a sale. Um, what could you could you run us through some some tips or some of the ways that you went about analysing and and making that decision? Because I, I, it's not it's not an easy one. It doesn't come naturally to a lot of people to to look at the books and kind of to work that out. Um, what are your, what, what do you, what was the process that you went through? Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of kicked myself cause I thought I knew the numbers pretty well. Um, but you know, we'd, we'd been operating for like two to three years. Um, you know, and I'd looked at the numbers, you know, at a, uh, I guess a macro level before, like a really high level, you know, looking at, you know, total, you know, total sales for the year and that kind of thing. Um, but I never really looked in uh, at the micro level. And, and this, I guess, is associated a bit with this idea of lean, you know, the lean, um, lean farming, lean production 
um, kind of really drilling into the detail of processes and um, yeah, and, and all the, the nitty gritties to to you know, because if you get those things right, then you, the macro level takes care of itself in a way. Um, so yeah, I was doing the, the top down analysis and not really finding anything, and suddenly did this this bottom up uh, more you know bottom up analysis and realized that um. Can I just pause? I'm sorry, Mikey. I've got some serious crying in the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No worries, mate. Go for it. Hey, you all just jumping in real quick to give a literal shout out to our Patreon members at patreon.com slash no-till growers. This fund is still the lifeblood of our work and we appreciate so much the support. It enables us to keep our work free and open to anyone and everyone. If that's something you believe in or appreciate, please consider pitching in a few bucks at patreon.com slash no-till growers. Also, there are some perks there, discounts on things like hats or the Living Soil Handbook. Uh, yes, I did mention hats. The hats will be returning soon, and patrons get first dibs on those. Also, any events we do in the future, and at a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another, you get a shout-out on the show. So big shout-outs this week to Brandon Bramer, Stephanie and Alex of Blue Berwyn Farm, Paul Salvatera, Stephen Smith, Ojai Roots, Scott Snodgrass, Jay Mill, Jacob Arthur, Jean-Martin Fortier and Yannick Laplante. Big thanks to anyone and everyone who supports our work in any way that you can. Check out notillgrowers.com slash support for all of our support opportunities. All right, back to the show. Hey there. I'm here, matey. <laughs> no stress. Um, yeah, so I guess um, really looking at the, you know, from the bottom up and, and looking at staff costs, uh, looking at unsold produce, so, you know, stuff that came home from market as, at an, as an average. And we could kind of look at all this stuff because, you know, we use uh, iPads with a, you know, the um, Square point of sale app. So we could really look at what we were selling. We could look at the discounts we were giving to stall, um, uh, to customers. So um, our market operates by, you know, a membership um, system and you get 10% off um, all of the stall holders um, produce if you become a member. So we were we were basically effectively giving out like three hundred to four hundred dollars of discounted produce um, a market that I really didn't factor in previously. Um, on top of that, you know, there's the stall fees, there's you know vehicle um, parking fees. You know, just really looking at every single cost uh, that goes into it, and obviously the big one is the labour labour cost for us. Um, but when I added all that up and looked at our overheads um, and, and worked, basically just did a, a break-even analysis, and um, which is, um, I want to I wanna write an article actually, that, you know, I remember reading something in Growing for Market about it and, yeah, it really, really hit home with me. So I think it'd be good to sort of, yeah, share how I did it, I guess, you know, on paper as well. But basically doing a break-even analysis um, to look at what, what was our break-even point and we worked out it was close to $4,000 a market. Um, so in summer we were doing those kind of numbers, but not consistently. Um, you know, we were doing three and a half to four uh, on a good market. Um, but in winter we were like we were barely pushing um, $1,500. Uh, so we we're making really big losses um, over winter, and you know, with our stall set up, it still required two people to to attend that market. Um, so we, you know, we had these overheads in terms of labour and stuff that just that weren't able to change. Um, so we really needed to be like selling, you know, all of that, you know, four thousand dollars of, of produce a, a week in order to make it work. Um, so that was a big eye opener, uh, and it was, um, you know, I guess in our again, you know, a bit of context in our market uh, at the farmers market. I knew we there wasn't enough demand to consistently do over, like let's say five thousand a week in summer, um, because there were other growers in the market as well. And then there, and then we couldn't produce like physically, we couldn't produce four thousand you know, plus dollars in winter. So we were really constrained on both sides of the season. Um, 
so basically I just I was like I think we we have to stop um and yeah within two weeks we'd, we'd given our notice um to the to the market um and I guess I don't know this is you know this is kind of I think we talked about this before but Sadly, like the farmer's market model, and particularly in Australia, um, I think it works at a different, you know, with a few different um, scales of production. Like I think if you're the owner operator and you're attending the market and not paying yourself, you know, award wages, you know, retail award wages, you you know, you can make it work at a lot less dollars than what we were we were doing. Um, and similarly, if you're a bigger grower and you, you are able to, you know, really um, bring that volume to, to make those numbers, it works as well. But we were kind of in that middle no man's land. Um, so that was, yeah, that was the challenge. And fundamentally, like I've, I've said it before, but basically it's like you imagine the, the farmer's market is this kind of, I don't know, if, if you compare it to a supermarket, it's like, you empty all the shelves off the supermarket shelf, um, all the products, and then you bring in just what the farmer's market has to offer, right? So, you know, it's not even going to feel like a tenth of the shelf space of a supermarket. Um, even a big market, you know, big farmer's market isn't going to fill those shelves. Um, and then so you've got half empty shelves, um, but then on the on the checkout you you have all of the farmers standing at, <laughs> standing at each till on the checkout and there might be like 40, 50 farmers, um, you know, 40, 50 lanes of the checkout operating. And, you know, when you put it in those terms, you realise kind of what a crazy thing a farmer's market is in in a way because it's it's just so labour inefficient. Um, and, and you know, I'm not the first one to, to recognise this um, by any means. Um, you know, I think an article where Chris Newman a while ago, you know, raised that very point about, you know, the, with the amount of labour that, that attends the market, you could, you know, you could run a store seven days a week, you know, 12 hours a day or whatever um, and reach a whole bunch more people um, when, when it's convenient for them. So it's, yeah, I think the model of a farmer's market is is challenging for certain at certain scales and certain uh, business models for sure. I know you've you've moved quite strongly the direction of strengthening your your online grocery sales, which I know in the Australian context in general, I think um, online e commerce and storefront and online sales of groceries is, is growing, and I think COVID naturally um, pushed those numbers to kind of skyrocket. Um, mm. Have you have you seen since? How long has it been since you've moved away from the farmers market now? Yeah, so we, I mean, we it's been uh, two. I oh don't know. We finished in like end of April, so May, June, July. So yeah, two months, two and a bit months. Um, so we definitely. Um, I mean, it's a hard time of year um, to really, you know, to see a difference because you're sort of coming off the back of the summer produce, and you've got your winter stuff um, coming in, and you know, we'll really need to to wait a year before we see you know any trends. Um, but the, like the early signs are definitely promising and, um, I guess it really comes down to, could you, could you talk us, could you talk us through your, your online sales, just give a bit of context, to, um, um, to that? Yeah. In terms of our, um, our model, I guess, um, prior to stopping the market, we were doing, um, two days of home delivery. Um, we do one day kind of locally. Uh, in the McLaren Vale region, and then one day in the city uh, and around surrounding suburbs. We, um, over the years, we've stocked more and more other local produce, um, and then we've also kind of um, backstopped our own produce with certified organic stuff. You know, for, for things that we don't grow, like potatoes and um, pumpkins and some bigger crops. Um, you know, getting some certified organic or all local stuff in where we can. Um, so basically trying to offer, you know, a, as wide a variety of, of veg and other local fruit and, and things as possible. And, um, so basically we, we stopped when we stopped the market, we, we just took on another day of, of delivery. Um, and it just felt so good to, to be finally 
just focusing on one thing. It was kind of like I just didn't realise how much space like mentally and physically the farmer's market was taking up um, because now we're really just dialed into, you know, online, um, you know, packing orders, delivering them, all of those things we can really um, dial in now rather than sort of having this split um, split kind of sales model, which, you know, there's, there's resilience in, in diversity for sure and that's something that we, you know, definitely will, will grapple with. Um, you know, for example, like your website goes down and suddenly you can't sell your product. Um, so, you know, there's there's definitely those those risks, I guess. But, you know, this, on the same token, there were risks associated with the farmer's market. You know, you get a, a rainy rainy day that you didn't forecast and suddenly it's all over. So, um, yeah, so that's that's really our model. And, and we're moving more and more to providing that full, um, you know, like – the, the next big challenge is is um, refrigerated um, dairy and meat and that's that sort of stuff because there's so many good farms in our area um, and you know just on a personal level as a customer I want to be able to buy direct from those from those growers you know um, from those producers so we want to offer that to to our customers as well. I um I, I want to understand also the online sales how it practically shapes your day-to-day on the farm um and one thing which i'm really interested in is 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 the pack and wash station and i know that if a lot of us farmers did a a time a time breakdown of our week i think a lot of us would be surprised that there's actually a huge amount of work on a farm which is not actually spent at all in a field practically growing but doing sales customer relationships planning finance delivery so forth yeah um and i know that the the pack and wash station is probably taking on more centrality in your business. Um, could you talk to us about, I'm interested to know a bit about, you know, workflow and infrastructure costs that maybe you've put in to make, make that space more comfortable and smooth. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, it's a huge, um, huge topic and, you know, <clears throat> a lot of, a lot of people have written a lot of good stuff about pack shed design and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, really uh, trying to eliminate as much lifting as as possible. Um, so in the early days, we we weren't didn't even have a slab. We just had gravel, and um, the cool room was up on a on a pad. So we had to lift everything. We, we couldn't use a ramp. We just had to lift everything, every single box, you know, in and out of the cool room multiple times, you know, to pack it and. Um, you know, you harvest it, you put it in the core and you bring it out again to pack it and you put the order back in the core and you bring it out again to deliver it and just so much um, heavy lifting and, and yeah, physical handling. So now we, you know, we've, we've got a slab. Um, the, the flow in terms of, you know, the detail is basically a product comes in from the field, it gets washed, it goes on racks in the cool room um, that are uh, that are on wheels. So we either pull when when it comes time to packing. So we've we've harvested all of the the items we need for the day. Um, basically, we wheel out the racks that we need to. Some of the racks just stay in the cool room because it's a nice big cool room now. And basically, we go along with carts. We've we've now got um, just recently the last week we've got iPads. Um, set up so that we're not, you know, so we're, we're um, basically packing to order with with iPads like like Amazon, <laughs> um, you know, just picking the stuff off the shelves as we go along, um, and we use a, a lean concept um, called Kanban to to restock um, particular items, so things that need weighing, um, like you know, potatoes for example. We've got we've got a a weigher who's out the you know behind the shelf basically weighing up produce uh, as soon as one bag gets taken off the shelf then then that that's the signal the kanban signal for the weigher to to restock that that line um so we're not you know we're not batch weighing at the start of the pack or anything we just we just get enough to fill the the kanban slots and then we're ready to go does that make sense yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so so then um, 
so once yeah so the the, the packers have got their their shopping carts um they're ticking things off on the iPad. If you know, we've set it up now so that if we can't supply an item, it'll email that person straight away once we've you know packed the order. Um, they go onto pallets in the cool room, and then we've set up a really kind of um, low-fi dock. Um, uh, so the cool room's got two doors: one you know incoming and outgoing. And basically, the van pulls up to the the dock. You know, we've got a, a you know, a bit of a MacGyvered kind of um, uh, loading ramp, and the that that you know is that fits the height of the van perfectly. So we just pallet jack the orders straight into the the van, and then um, yeah, they go off go off on delivery. It's it's am- it's amazing how a, a a smooth operating system inside a pack wash can just really bring. A different energy to a farm it's a, it is really a buzzing a buzzing hive of activity where there is the potential for a lot of mistakes and a lot of anxiety for for workers and staff who are in there making sure that orders are packed correctly um if you're working with restaurants making sure that the correct numbers are going out so forth so it's really it's really amazing hearing how you've put that together i really like that um that you're using a lot more of the the techie side of stuff i know that like you're saying before using using the iPads at the farmer's market and tracking that data. Basically, it's very difficult to do that with a pen and paper when you've got a huge line um, and then collecting that data and making it accessible. As you said, you're walking around with iPads as well. Uh, are you using a, an, online, an online program to be able to manage those orders? Yeah, well, I, so I, in a past life, I, I've you know, dabbled in software um, development database design stuff. So I actually um, built a custom... Um, app i guess uh using filemaker filemaker pro um which is a cloud-based um database um design platform and um so yeah we we use that to kind of pull all our orders together from our online store um you know to assign which days they're going out for delivery um yeah it's it's really the interface between our website and um you know the, the the stuff that happens on the ground and that was you know we tried to fit all of that in in the website itself but we were just coming back like we we're trying to custom code stuff on the back end of the website and getting like ridiculous quotes for um custom coding um when i knew i could just do it for free um you know <laughs> for free but you know like a, a lot cheaper um you know, using this this custom custom app, and we used Airtable for a while, which was which was great. But it, we sort of hit the limits as we started to go to three days of of packing, um, and it was also really hard to delegate the process uh, in terms of collating orders and stuff. It was very, it's a very manual process on Airtable. Um, you know, you've you've got to go to certain views and filters and blah blah blah. So FileMaker, that all of that's kind of scripted and coded. Um, behind the scenes so that it's easy for, for other people to to do the work and it, i just should point out as well you know making these changes um we've actually managed to reduce the amount of space we take up in the pack shed over time even though we're doing more and more um orders as well as we streamline things and i think you know there's <clears throat> there's definitely something to be said for having the right amount of space in a pack shed but a lot of the designs I see, are, there's a lot of wasted movement um, in in the design, um, and you know that that really adds up in terms of of time, but also the costs of you know pouring a big slab and building a big roof over a shed and all of that stuff. You know when you really look at your your processes and what you know in the lean in sort of lean speak, you know what's what's adding value versus what's waste. Um, there's very little movement that adds value. Um, so we just try to eliminate as much as we can of that, that waste. Yeah. Um, and I think what you said there is, yeah, it makes complete sense. And again, it comes down to what you're saying. It comes down to tracking, really tracking the steps and processes, which is something I, I'd really taking from this conversation with is to drill that home and um, being very conscious about how we're constructing flows, um, tracking data, 
um, and like you said, using your online platform. And I want to also ask you about your cool room, which I saw recently you guys upgraded. And I think the pack and wash is is so important as well for making sure that produce stays as fresh as it can, you know, hydro cooling, taking that field heat off, off crops and getting into a cool room um, has, you know, that's something which also really defines a lot of the small scale organic producers as having really high quality. Um, yeah. Is that something you've found as well? Um, what what sort of mechanisms for really keeping produce as fresh as possible in your pack and wash have you put into place? Yeah, I mean, it's again, um, really, yeah, looking at looking at the waste that we used to harvest into our delivery van um, when we were, when we were just doing two two deliveries a week, and what would happen is because the delivery van is big and generally. Um, you know, you don't want to drive it around the field too much. So we, you know, we park in one spot in the field, and then all go out to the, you know, various spots of the field with with crates and harvest and bring it back to the van. So it was a lot of walking around the fields, um, but then also a lot of waiting. The the produce would be picked, but then it would just sit in the van for two hours while the rest of the produce, you know, um, is harvested. So yeah, really looking at the 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 process of like what's happening to each bunch of kale or whatever and, and thinking well why does the kale have to wait <laughs> for all the other produce to get picked before it gets washed um because and i should point out that um our field is you know it's probably 500 600 meters away from our wash pack and that that you know that wasn't in, intentional but the village uh there was a shed an existing shed there that wasn't near the, the market garden so so we've we're sort of stuck having to do runs back and forth between the field and the, and the pack chain. Um, so we thought originally we were like, oh, it's really efficient to like fill the van up and just do one run down with a with a van full of product. But um, you know, as as you know, like stuff sits around long enough, it gets wilted, and by the time you've got it in the cool room, it's it's not at its at its peak. So we um, so we've switched over now to to a little um, electric. Um, like little electric vehicle, like four wheel drive um, Polaris, um, which is it's tiny and it, and the tray is tiny, um, but it's intentionally tiny because it means that um, when when the crew is harvesting, you know, it doesn't take long to fill it up, and then it's that again, it's that Kanban signal of, okay, the, the Polaris is full, like we better go do a run, um, and it only takes you know less than a minute to go down there to drive down there. But what it means is that that product is is being harvested, washed, and in the cool room a lot quicker. It's not sitting around uh, wilting in the heat of summer anymore. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's been a big change uh, in how we we manage the harvest. We're still not quite there yet in in terms of the delivery. So what what will happen is um, product will be harvested in the morning. We'll pack in the afternoon. And then the orders will will wait in the cool room overnight um, to be delivered the next day. Um, the ideal for us, um, and this is taking a um, taking a note from um, Edie Grocer uh, in um, Mornington. I think they're, they're based in Mornington, aren't they? Um, basically, they they do everything on on the same day, um, which means you're not even really having to worry about you know orders sitting around in the cool room either you can just pack them straight into a refrigerated van and then the van goes out in the afternoon and does the does the delivery so that's that's the the you know the next step for us is is reducing that amount of time that the orders that are sitting around waiting to to get to customers doors and really um you know that that means we can offer you know picked packed and delivered within like 12 to 15 hours um kind of you know selling proposition which is like pretty unbeatable. Like no one's, no other like large scale producer is going to match those kind of stats. And that's I think where the small local farms uh, really have have the upper hand. It's really exciting hearing you. Like I can also hear your passion kind of coming through. I, I you know, like you said before, that uh, t- taking off that load, um, that mental load that when you were dividing your attention amongst the farmers market and this sales and that, and really honing into your online sales and delivery, I, I can I can hear in the way you're talking that it's it's given you a, a sharpness and a way of thinking about um, operating, which is which is really really awesome to hear. Um, and my last question on the on on the cool room, however, is is kind of it's linking to something else, which I think we'll we'll lead into as well. But it's 
it's it's designing spaces in the sense that calculating space in the room you need. I know I, I've heard a lot of young growers talking about, oh, how do I how do I decide on the size of a cool room? And I think sometimes what we we can we can do as farmers is actually underinvest in our infrastructure and we outgrow it a lot faster. And therefore, there's actually a lot of headaches down the road when you have to obviously think about expanding a cool room as opposed to buying one at the at a time maybe you don't use the entire thing originally but you you enable space for growth and development in your business yeah totally i mean i think it's it's a tricky balance isn't it because you know like we started off with a two by two by two cube um cool room and that was that was the one where we were just you know um you know putting things in by hand all the time um we we you know very quickly um outgrew that in terms of our ideal but you know it's still we still managed to make it last for like two two years um before deciding to um finally bite the bullet and and build a bigger one um i guess yeah it you know the lean again this lean idea like you don't want to over you, you know there's a risk in under investing sure but you also don't want to over invest because who knows where you're going to be um you know, in a year's time, um, and and maybe that capital is better spent, um, you know, growing seed and and that other, that, you know, actual production as well. Because really, when you look at it, like a cool room is just another form of waste, right? Like it's not, um, it you know, it's it might be adding a bit of value in terms of cooling the crops down and and pr- preserving their um, shelf life, but it's not. It's just a, a, a waiting bay, you know. <laughs> Um, it's not really, you know, it's not getting the product any closer to the consumer. Um, so I guess, yes, you know, adequately sizing your cool room is important. Um, but also, you know, if we packed, um, into a refrigerated van on the day, we could eliminate half, you know, half the space of our existing cool room, um, just, just by that simple measure. So, um, it's not, I, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a hard question to answer, but, but I would say, you know, we, we looked at the cool bot, um, kind of systems and, and in the end went with a, um, just a standard, you know, commercial, um, compressor system just to get that, that field heat out really quickly, I think is important. Um, so yeah, that's. And also important to note that you're growing in a, in a hot, um, a very a very warm Mediterranean climate. So getting that field heat off in your climate is probably across across a, more months than happen in a lot of you know in a temperate area or a cool climate. Totally, yeah, yeah. And stuff's coming in like when we're picking some of the last crops of the day. You know, they'll be up around thirty degrees. Um, so uh, yeah, they're pretty warm coming in. Another piece of um, infrastructure net that I'm. Um, I wanted to talk to you about is um, is actually farming with a tractor and also your compost spreader. And I know um, in the small scale community, you know, I think mechanization use of tractors isn't a given. And I think it's a really a really nice thing that it's not a given in our style of farming. Um, but I wanted to I wanted to ask you about what what prompted the decision to include a tractor in your farm and then subsequently the um, the compost spreader. Yeah, so I guess, you know, we were probably two or three years in and just physically, like, you know, just getting absolutely exhausted at the end of every day. Um, and, you know, you can, yeah, we like we're not all, you know, we're all in our, like, mid to late 30s to 40s to 50s, um, you know, like we're not spring chickens and, um, you know, it was just – like the relentless broad forking and um, compost spreading and everything was just really wearing us down. Um, and I'd seen a farm from the States, uh, Excelsior Farm now, now called Commonplace Farm, um, uh, use a small tractor, you know, with with the, the standard kind of bed widths and uh, and everything that a lot of a lot of growers are using, you know, based on the Elliot Coleman um kind of bed widths so I, I knew that it was possible and um, that really yeah that really inspired me to to look at what was available in Australia and and really um, I guess intentionally piece together equipment that would fit you know with our bed widths and paths and and you know that so that it all kind of worked together as a system because I knew that was important um, 
you know, when you're migrating to a tractor kind of system. So, um, yeah, we, we've, we've been using that for three years now, I guess. Um, and just, you know, just a massive, massive game changer. Like I can't, can't describe, I mean, I had to load some compost at a friend's place the other day by hand and I just like, it nearly killed me and, and it just brought home, like I'd sort of forgotten how hard it is to load with shovels and wheelbarrows and um, you just forget, you know, after you've you've been using a tractor for a few years, you forget how hard it is. So, um, you know, like a, uh, loading a loading a bed of compost and spreading a bed of compost now with our compost spreader takes about six minutes from like go to woe. Um, so we can we can spread, you know, as many beds as we need for the day um, with with our with our little spreader. Um, so that's yeah, that's just been a huge game changer. The compost spreader was one that I've I've often looked with envy. I think kind of the, the number tracking that you did um, in your for your farmers market, I was doing quite often um, when I was when I was in the fields, um, get composting with wheelbarrows and, and looking at you know sometimes there were there were hours and hours and of, of time and energy put into it, and when I was thinking and looking at your compost spreader that you, in, you know in a single pass your your you're composting a bread six minutes. Um, it's kind of mind blowing in terms of the labour costs, which we've spoken about before, is is not something to be toyed with, at least in the Australian context. But in all farms, you know, managing labour costs is is uh, an incredibly important thing. Um, yeah. Can you can you also talk a little bit with us about the tractor in terms of your cover cropping, which I've seen you doing more lately, and 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 whether whether the the including a tractor in your operation was also an, a reason that you went down the path of also cover cropping. Yeah, I mean, I guess I should just um, say as well, just you know, touching on what you said about um, you know labour and labour costs and stuff. That yeah, it's it's interesting in the Australian context because our labour costs are so much higher than the US, where a lot of these models uh, of small scale um, profitable growing are coming from. Um, you know, like probably almost three times higher wage costs. Um, than the US, so which tells me that we need to be investing in mechanization and, and equipment purchases at a scale that's three times smaller <laughs> than it would make sense for in the US. So, you know, a lot of a lot of the farms, you know, a lot of the dialogue in, in the States is saying, oh well, you know, a tractor doesn't make sense at an acre and it probably doesn't over there, but but here I think it really, really does make a lot of financial sense. Like the the loan repayments for our tractor, it was basically one day's wages for, for a monthly loan repayment. Um, so, you know, when you think about how much work a tractor can get done in that month, like it just is a total no brainer. Um, but yeah, in terms of cover cropping, we're still kind of um, uh, working out how to integrate that into our system. We, we've got another half acre of land that we can expand to if we need. And so we've just been cover cropping that over the last three years um, and trying different strategies to some other weeds and, and build fertility and, and that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, the, the, like the last season we, um, for the previous, previous summer we bare fallowed. So we actually, you know, disked the ground, like total, like horrible tillage, um, <laughs> bare scorched earth kind of style because I'd read, you know, somewhere that it's like if you want to get rid of your summer um, rhizome, you know, weeds, then this is one way to do it. And we didn't have enough tarps to cut cover half an acre. And so, you know, I thought, okay, we'll give that a shot. And um, it was just a nightmare. Like the way, you know, the, the cooch grass, which we have is our main rhizome uh, grass, it, it barely made a dent in it, but it just totally killed off, you know, all the soil life and <clears throat> just, yeah, it was a nightmare. So I was like, okay, we're never doing that again. So this this season or this summer, we actually mowed the, the winter cover crop um, quite high and kind of pushed it over with the, with the tractor, a bit, you know, like a poor man's roller crimper basically. And, um, and really just had that cover over summer and um, it made a huge difference. And um, 
you know, we, we had a, a wetter than usual summer, <coughs> excuse me, and um, we just found that, yeah, it really smothered out a lot of the cooch and it protected the soil surface. And um, so coming into to autumn and sowing another cover crop, you know, I just had to, to do one pass with a disc um, and broadcast the seed and disc again to cover it up and, and you know, away we go. So, um, yeah, it's definitely um, – definitely made a big difference um, in terms of what we can achieve at scale. You know, having that kind of mechanisation is, is yeah, amazing. The mechanisation that you're saying and, and managing managing labour, um, we spoke about it and you hinted at the beginning that you've actually got quite a large staffing um, staffing group with you, not all on, on full-time wages, they're casual. But I, I know you've got a very unique structure um, which is based around a lot of flexibility um, could you share with us a little bit of, about about that and why why you put that into place? Yeah, I guess fundamentally, like um, no no one, and I'm include I'm including myself in this. No one wants to work full time in the fields. Like um, it just you know it's physically exhausting, um, mentally exhausting. You know, you need like we all need time to get away from it. Um, on, on top of that, we all have you know, young families, um, you know, there's, there's school pickups and drop-offs and um, all of the, that kind of stuff to, to work around. Um, so, yeah, we really tried to be conscious about fitting the farm into those other, you know, really important parts of our lives. And, um, and one, the, the way we've done that is by having more staff um, to, to do more shifts and cover, you know, cover more shifts um, rather than just having, you know, like a core team that's just, you know, working 50, 60 hour weeks. Um, and, it, you know, it's got its own drawbacks um, in terms of, you know, training more people and more complicated, you know, um, rostering and, and all that sort of stuff. But I think, you know, the, the benefits far outweigh those drawbacks. And, um, yeah, we, we really... Um, it's it's nice, you know, it's nice to have a, a big crew. I always love working, you know, having a, a decent sized crew to, to work uh, alongside and um yeah, it's just it just feels right for, for, for our context. Your uh, managing a lot of staff is is not an easy not an easy thing and in a previous conversation you you spoke with me about um your your standard work procedures. Which you put in, which you put into place, and I'd I'd love to hear a little bit about maybe a few examples of perhaps what what is a, a standard work procedure and practically how you go about designing them for different processes. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're by no means um, there. You know, we we haven't like documented everything, um, but we're definitely trying to make things more standard so that, so that everyone can um, can pick up you know where someone left off. Um, so, you know, for example, in summer, we, we actually have Mondays off, like no one works in the, in the field on Mondays um, or at the farm at all. Um, so, but someone has to go in and pick cucumbers and zucchinis and stuff, right? So, so we have a, you know, just a simple A4 sheet that goes through all the things that need to happen on a Monday, um, you know, the, the expected time that it should take and, you um, yeah, just really kind of spelling it out. So there's, so it's just more as, as a cue or a reminder for the the person doing the work than anything. And once they've done it enough, obviously they um they rem they remember it. But what's interesting, like it sort of feels, you know, we we track a lot of stats as well in terms of our packing times and things. And at first, it felt like it was going to be really kind of um yeah, like draconian or you know like what I was worried that you know everyone would feel really under pressure. But it's actually had the opposite effect. I, I think, you know, I mean, I'm speaking, um, I'm not speaking for everyone, but I think um, really most of us are kind of excited to see how we did compared to yesterday or last week or, you know, so it's keeping those kind of stats really visible in the pack shed and, and the field and saying, you know, did we make our target? You know, did we, um, did we, did, or did we beat it? Or if we didn't make it, like, why didn't we make it? What was wrong? And, and that, you know, really leads to that feedback and trying to troubleshoot problems and stuff. And so it's it's been really, really eye opening and, and interesting. You know, just putting a few more numbers to to our performance and um, 
and you know, and doing it in a way that's inclusive as well, obviously. And yeah, it's it's made a made a great difference. I like that you shared that about you know being a bit a bit worried about putting putting into place um, these you know, you know timing this and testing that. But I think sometimes we underestimate how much these these small things, while they might seem a little bit you know stale or a little bit corporate in a way, so to speak, they they actually <laughs> give a lot of they they empower staff members and it, it democratizes i think the processes that we're that we do and it gives it gives them the ability to kind of to analyze them as well take part in the processes um and understand why they're doing and why we're doing what we're doing and i've known that you know i've worked um i've worked in a number of places which which that sort of workflow has been in place and i've always felt much more comfortable in that scenario rather than rather than the the, the opposite yeah, totally. And it just, it's, it turns it into a game, you know, it's like, how can we beat yesterday's crew, you know? Um, and it brings, brings that kind of, you know, fun, fun energy um, to, to a pick. Whereas, yeah, and it, before, like, I don't know how I'm doing, like, did, did we do that well today? I don't really know. So it's having that feedback, I think is, yeah, really important. I want to ask now, what have, what have been some of the main realizations over the years that have surprised or excited or even perhaps challenged your vision of small scale organic farming? Oh, like it's an ongoing battle, isn't it really? Um, I think, you know, the, the, the challenge of, of profitability, um, is, is, is always, is a constant challenge. Um, you know, not, um, you know, we're not, and we're not there yet. Um, not where we want to be sort of, you know, that triple bottle bottom line, um, financially and socially and environmentally. So that's definitely, yeah, an ongoing challenge. Um, I think, um, one of the things that surprised me was, I guess, um, enjoying the role as, um, you know, leader and, and manager more. I never thought I, I would, um, but, but I have. I felt like I've you know, really enjoyed growing into that role as well and um, fostering that in, in our employees as well so that, you know, more and more people are able to, to, to take things on and delegate. And um, I guess, you know, my vision is that we're, we're a big enough small farm that we can, you know, have some opportunity for people to rise through the ranks and have some diversity of, of positions and that kind of thing rather than just everyone is like, just the grunt worker, you know, slogging it out. Um, that's my vision. And, you know, we, we're, we're still on, on, on that path. We're definitely not there yet, but, but I think, yeah, that, that'd be awesome. What else can we expect from Village Greens over the next coming years? <laughs> um, well, like I said, you know, we're like, we're really working on this idea of, um, you know, and it's not our product, but, but basically just having the full offering, um, you know, available to, to customers so they can order the local milk and uh, get some free range chicken and, and all of that to, to complement what we grow. Um, that, that to me is, is the next big frontier and really looking forward to how we, yeah, we tackle that challenge over the, the coming, coming year. Matt, just wanted to say a massive thanks for coming on. I always appreciate your, um, your honesty and your passion and, I I've get a, a real kick out of following your journey. You grow beautiful crops um, and you're doing an amazing service to um, the community around you. So thanks a lot for hopping on the show. Yeah, likewise, Mikey. Thanks for doing what you do and I'm glad to be a part of it. This episode of the No-Till Market Garden Podcast Southern Hemisphere Edition was produced by Mikey Densham with special help from No-Till Growers. Music by Willie Breeding. If you enjoyed this and you want to support our work, go to patreon.com slash no-till growers or no-tillgrowers.com slash support. Thanks for listening and we'll see you all next week. Bye.